This is the Great North Wrestling Podcast, the official podcast of the Hannibal TV, Canada's number one pro wrestling YouTube channel, with your host, three-time Canadian champion and GNW lead reporter, Devin Hannibal Nicholson. This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com, and on the line we have two-time WWE Tag Team Champion, uh, All Japan, Wrestle One, and Hustle Japanese competitor who is going to make, I believe, his 50th tour soon. And of course, he was a former Great North Wrestling Canadian champion, Rene Dupree, who just came from the gym. How are you, Rene? <laughs> uh, cooling down from the workout, brother. What are your some of your best lifts that you've ever uh, pulled off in the gym? Um, well, when I was younger, I went a lot heavier, right? Like when I was 16, I had a 500-pound bench press and a 650-something squat. So, which is probably why I got my first hernia from the squats. <laughs> so it's safe to say you weren't bullied too much in high school with a 500-pound bench press. Uh, uh, no, I've always been a loner, Devin. So, uh, no, nah, people didn't really mess with me now. And you just came off a successful tour in Europe. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I went there and uh, got there the 1st of April and stayed till mid-June. And I did like eight or nine different countries. And um, yeah, I'm heading back in the fall, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun over there. Especially when you're not working for Brian Dixon. You know that from experience, don't you, bud? Yeah, I think the lowest point, uh, one of the low points of working for him was that time where you were suffering from really bad cramps in that van and they wouldn't pull the van over. Yeah, I know. My quads were about to tear because I was dehydrated in the middle of the summer in England, yeah. You were there for that? Yeah, I, re I remember that because they, were, they wouldn't pull over to go to the bathroom unless you literally begged them and... Like, you were in extreme pain that day, I remember, and they wouldn't pull the van over. And, yeah. Did we have all the merchandise cramped up in the van, too, so there was, like, literally no room? I forget. Yeah, it, w it was terrible, and Carl Ouellette was there, too. Speaking of uh, Carl Ouellette, what do you think of uh, his success recently on the independent scene? Man, he deserves it. I'm so happy for him. Uh, I don't really follow much wrestling and stuff, but, you know, on Facebook and stuff, you see stuff that... You know, that guy, uh, he's been in the business, what, 30, probably 30 more, or more years, you know? And uh, I'm happy for him, man, because he's, he's a hell of a guy. You were tag team partners with him at least a couple times in England, too. Oh, we worked together a lot, yeah. We did good business over there together. Really good. And for Japan, I think you're going back again soon. Is it your 50th tour coming up or somewhere yeah. around there? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, 50th. Uh, man, time flies. Who is the company you're working for this time? Uh, Land's End. Okay. It's uh, it's like a sister company to all of Japan, but I got meetings with uh, all three of the top companies over there, so we'll see what happens, you know. Why do you think there's uh, less Americans being used over there now? Of course, New Japan has their deal with Ring of Honor, but it seems like in the past there was a lot more Americans being used. Well, I don't think businesses. It's oversaturated over there with too many promotions, so you can only cut the pie so many times, you know what I mean? So I think, uh, I mean, New Japan is obviously the, the leader, and, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I think it has boils down to money, basically. And for Impact Wrestling, we were talking about it a couple of days ago. They uh, hit an extremely low rating last week, under 200,000 uh, viewers. Compare that to the Hannibal TV, which has 300,000 viewers a day. And uh, Really? You have that many? Yeah, we uh, our videos get approximately 300,000 views a day. Wow. Well, uh, shit, man, I'm going to work for you. A lot lower <laughs> budget. But... They're owned by a Canadian company. Uh, I mean, I was talking to Ted Hart, who's one of the top Canadian talents. Uh, yeah. They don't use him on TV. They don't use you. They don't use me. They don't use Harry. Like, what do you think about the the people that are running uh, TNA right now? I know Don Callis, for about a year, he had a 
wrestling company in Winnipeg that wasn't successful. Scott Demore has had more success with Border City Wrestling, but what's your opinion of them? Uh, they both worked for my dad in 1997s. And I think, yeah, 98, Scott came back too. He worked here. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, unless you're in their position, it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to judge or critique or whatever. I'm sure it's not easy. I'm sure there's a lot of rules that they have to follow that maybe you and I are not aware of, you know. But um, uh, I don't want to be negative Nancy over here, but I've literally never watched their show. Um, I tried watching a few times, but as soon as I see, like, an Ingrin promo with really bad acting, I get turned off. You know, that's why I like watching Japanese wrestling because it's more sports-based. You know what I mean? Yeah, even with WWE, I find uh, the few times I've tried to watch it, it seems they're trying to make their wrestlers out to be comedians, which wrestlers, for the most part, aren't comedians, and wrestling fans aren't watching it for comedy, for the most part, so I've never understood that. Yeah, in my opinion, if you want comedy, bring in the midgets. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I asked you about this before but I'll bring it up again because it's been in the news there's been a little, some news this week I know you know, knew uh, Randy Orton but there's a whole controversy I guess um, in the old days I guess Kurt Bowers come out about this and some other writers he used to talk to the writers when they would start and have his hand grabbing his uh, groin area allegedly and then he would ask the, the writers to shake his hand uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, that's not uncommon for wrestlers to joke around like that in the dressing room. Yeah, I think, I think um, if you're around the boys, I mean, the the wrestlers are a different breed than, let's say, these corporate Hollywood writers. So maybe you should, <laughs> you know, keep that stuff in the locker room, in the dressing room, and not necessarily with these, you know, Hollywood writers, because I don't think they have the same mentality that we do. So if that happened, I don't. I never seen it, so I can't say it happened or it didn't happen. Uh, uh, I really don't give a shit, to be honest with you. And what do you think about uh, all these wrestlers dying? I know some of them, like Bruno Sammartino, he was older this year, yeah. but there was a younger guy like Brian Danovich recently, this doc dean from england yeah. brian lawler yeah. jim Knightheart this week uh what do you do to to avoid being depressed when you keep hearing about all these deaths uh, well like okay so for july right i did a five-week tour so the first day i get to toronto i get word that matt capitelli died of the brain tumor right and then at the end of the tour that's when there was three three deaths in one day there was uh Brian Lawler from suicide, uh, Brickhouse Brown from cancer, and then uh, Nikolai Volkov, I believe, from old age or, or whatever, you know. So, yeah, and then, um, and then a few days later, that tough enough guy, Brian Dynamich, he, he kills himself. And then, you know, Nyhart goes and passes away at 63. And he was suffering from uh, Alzheimer's, which I think he got diagnosed a few years ago for so for a guy in his early 60s to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's, that's that's, that's a little, you know, it's not normal. So I'm I'm wondering if, you know, talk with all these concussions and brain injuries, if that has something to do with it. Because it does lead to uh, depression. It does lead to homicidal and suicidal behaviors. So I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if that has something to do with it. And that's why I guess your old partner, he's part of that, uh, the WWE lawsuit there, Sylvain Grenier, uh, I guess, yeah. from being dropped on his head by the Dudleys or something like that. Well, he, uh, he, uh, he actually, he hid it from me, but he was, he was working with a broken neck. It was not until uh, about a year or so ago when we, when I actually went to his house and he showed me the x-ray, he has like, um, he had a hairline fracture in his neck to where he was wrestling with a broken neck and, I mean, it was different back then. You weren't supposed to, if you were hurt, you'd kind of try to not tell anybody and stuff because you don't want to lose your spot. But I know, uh, I know for a fact that he he has a lot of issues now too. So, and he was never a, a big drinker. He never, never, ever did drugs. So, um, I don't know, man. Yeah, we recently posted a match he had had against uh, Max Testosterone on our YouTube channel, and 
didn't seem to be in the shape that he used to be in, but the match was all right. But hopefully he's doing okay. Uh, well, he's he's over 40 now, and I think he just had a, a baby. So he's got the dad bod going on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there ever going to be a, a baby in your life? I can't see it happening. <laughs> Why not? Am I too crazy to have kids? <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. I just can't. You don't seem like the type that uh, would want to be a father. <laughs> uh, no, I think me and me and the missus have discussed that it's probably for our best interest that we uh, don't reproduce. <laughs> now, what you about never your, know. You never know, bro. Never what know. about your brother? Is there going to be another generation uh, Dupree wrestler in the family eventually? Uh, highly unlikely. So you're going to have to bring back uh, Atlantic Grand Prix again in the future and really give it a go. Yeah, i got nothing else to live for. Wrestling's my life, man. Um, what are some of your favorite memories uh, of going to your dad's shows when you were young? Um, every Monday it was Cocan Arena. That was like our, our hometown show, right? And then, I don't know, back then you could smoke in the arenas or whatever, so it just... It wasn't the healthiest thing, but it's like the one light over the ring, the smoke-filled arenas, and just the place was always packed. And it's just uh, the atmosphere. Then my dad would always leave before the main event because he wanted to beat the traffic, but it always left me wanting more, right, because I never wanted to leave. I always wanted to see the ending, but I never got to see it. But um, traveling, like my dad would buy an RV. He bought an RV, and, like, the whole family would travel, you know. So that was good times. I mean, always bring usually a top heel with us. And then I remember one night, it might have been Killer Call Croup or, or somebody anyway. Here in the Maritimes, you worked here, you know, they still believe. <laughs> they get rowdy, right? So, I mean, we'd have the heel, and he left with so much heat that the people were throwing beer bottles at the RV. and It's kind of crazy, but at the same time, it's, it was great. You know? Yeah, David Schultz uh, told us in his recent shoot interview with the Hannibal TV that... Uh, he actually saved Dennis Condry's life uh, one night. Uh, he didn't remember what town, I don't think, but I guess the crowd had stormed the ring or something, and he had to come out with hockey sticks. Oh, yeah. To, oh, yeah, they would ride here, man. It would be crazy. I guess it's not like that too much anymore uh, with, uh, I guess, so many promotions and kayfabe being gone. Yeah, I think I think the fact that kayfabe's kind of dead, it uh, kind of kills it, yeah. Oh, it is what it is. There are a lot of uh, promotions in the Maritimes now. What do you think the reason is why there's so many compared to uh, other areas? There seems to be a lot running regularly. I, do, I really don't follow it. I know there's a couple of them, but uh, no, nah, I, really, I really don't follow it. It's just like that everywhere. I mean, there's an oversaturation everywhere. Anybody can buy a ring. Anybody can, you know, print posters and put a card together and run shows. You know, there's no laws against it, no regulations, so. What do you think the key was to your father's success? He was the only one running. You know what I mean? Right. And he he would wake up at 6 a.m. every night, and he'd go to bed at 1 in the morning. He only slept about five hours a night, if that He'd work, 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 and and he he was the the only boss. You understand? He's the one that made all the decisions, and it was a family-run business. He made sure, like the ring crew and referee was my aunt and uncle, right? And at one point, man, he had like two crews a night. He would run two shows a night, seven nights a week, six months out of the year. So. And then he'd do double shots on Saturdays and Sundays. So he had up to 16 shows in one week. You know what I mean? And all the guys that had to work, I mean, it wasn't terrific money, but it was a living. And, you know, you could keep yourself... Like, guys would come here and had no experience, like green as grass. By the time they left the Maritimes, they could have a match with anybody. And they were, like, seasoned. You know what I mean? So. And he never charged people for training either, did he? No, never. No. Uh, later on, when I was on TV and stuff, uh, so many people were calling him and stuff. Uh, so he got it, but he'd only charge guys like I don't know, like twenty-five bucks for a day or something like that. You know, they never charged two or three thousand, or never did. 
And all the guys he broke in, too. I mean, shit. A lot of the fans nowadays wouldn't know who they are, but the guys that they worked with, you you know. Like Don Jardine, the original spoiler, Undertaker copied that guy to a T. And guys like Bruiser Brody and Stan Hansen credit guys like Don Jardine for teaching them. You understand? Yeah. And then you got the Cormier brothers, like Leo. If you ever, I think, read Bret Hart's book, he puts Leo over for teaching him psychology, you know. If you read Stan Hansen's book, he puts over the Beast, who is Yvon Cormier, who's the guy who trained me. Uh, it's a hell, of a hell of a worker. He was the eldest of the Cormiers, so. Um, there's a lot of truth. And then, again, they were all underneath my father. My father broke all those guys in and gave them their start and got them booked everywhere. Got them booked in Amarillo for the Funks, got them booked in uh, the Carolinas for the Crockett's, got them booked in Calgary for Stu. You know, he helped a lot of people out. Didn't Rick Martel start out in that territory too? I don't I don't know if he started. He probably started in Montreal. I know he worked here, but he worked for the opposition. Uh, oh, okay. I forget the name. But uh, in 1997, when he was getting ready to go back to WWF, it was actually him and Don Callis that were going to start a tag team called the Supermodels. He came here. and uh, To me, I'll put over Rick Martel as one of the classiest businessmen wrestlers like if you want to strap you'd be like somebody in the business be like him <laughs> because he retired and he's very wealthy and he's a smart businessman and just a class act you know yeah and you saved your money well too for the the period you were in there so you did take some tips from i guess your father yeah like my first year on raw was probably my best year financially or whatever i set all my money at home you know i made sure i paid my taxes and uh i didn't buy a car or any of that jazz. I sent all my money home and we built um, apartment complexes. So now I own three. And by the time I'm 40, they'll be completely paid off and I'll have a steady six-figure income. And, uh, yeah, I can relax and <clears throat> don't do jack shit. <laughs> uh, during that run, didn't you uh, have some interactions with The Rock at one point? Uh, yeah, we did uh, in Anaheim, California. It was me and Rob Conway. We did a little, we did a little thing in the ring with um, Mick Foley, and the, the the crowd didn't know he was there. The Rock, I'm talking about. And when his music hit, man, wow, that that's when you know someone's over. Cause just in unison, twenty thousand people going to their feet, it's like a wave, and I, you just get goosebumps. And and he was a, he was a he was a pro. And his dad is a maritimer, man, from Amherst, Nova Scotia, right next to New Brunswick. Yeah, one of these days uh, we'll definitely do that combined event uh, around that area with the Rock's dad. I do think he needs to uh, to make a return one day. Oh yeah, uh, that would be really cool. Yeah, definitely, let's make that happen. And I believe, speaking of concussions that we were talking about earlier, I'll just bring this up to wrap it up. We did an interview with Hyden right last year and. He's definitely suffering from concussion issues, without question. He doesn't seem to be all there anymore. You, you guys worked with him. Uh, what was it like being in the ring with that guy? Oh, one of the nicest guys in the world, man. Just a big, a big, a big teddy bear, you know. But uh, I think life on the road and uh, isn't cut out for everybody, you know. And uh, but he's from Louisiana. He's, he's just a good, good dude. But sometimes his business, uh, they can mess with your head, you know. It's not necessarily just the business, but being away from home, sometimes your spouse, being away from your, your family, and paranoia sets in, and you don't know what's going on at home. And there's all kinds of different factors, right? Yeah. So, But, uh, yeah, I, I saw him, and it's, it's sad to see him that way because uh, I think he does have a lot of issues. As do a lot of us. You know. And for you, basically, you believe your bridge is burnt with WWE. And <laughs> <laughs> burnt to a curse, Devin. <laughs> I'll tell you this much. Uh, I will never, under any circumstance, show up to one of their shows looking for a job. That's never, ever going to happen. It hasn't happened in 12 years, and it'll never, ever happen. If they wanted me, they'd have to come to me. So with that attitude... Uh, I think the bridge is burnt, my friend. 
Yeah, so you're going to focus on Japan, trying to get in with uh, one of the larger companies, I guess, and, and hopefully uh, build your own uh, territory back up one day. Yeah, just stay booked and, uh, and have fun. I mean, I'm living proof. Like, uh, I'm, not, I'm not stupid, okay? <clears throat> if it wasn't for their exposure on their television, there's no way I'd still be able to work today. There's no way you would be booking me and all that other jazz, right? It's obvious, okay? But... Um, uh, to go, to go back there, and, and I know things are supposed to be different now and great, but I just had so many bad, bad moments there with certain people who are still there and still in positions of power. That I, I I'm sorry, I, I just, I don't know what I would do if I saw those certain people. You know what I mean? One talks like this. Okay. <laughs> And speaking of uh, bookings, uh, people can book you through your your Facebook if they're listening to this and they're a wrestling promoter and they want to book you for a show. Obviously, you're still in. You're probably in the best shape ever right now, from what I've seen. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm working out twice a day and just well, I've always eaten he- <clears throat> healthy and yeah. Hopefully, they don't judge me by the shit they see on the WWE Network because I was only a little kid. My work has definitely gotten a lot better since then and um oh there's a twitter page too uh, uh renee dupree on twitter yeah i got long hair and so you can go through there and book me as well yeah i don't run the page but uh those people know how to contact me so and you're still taking hip tosses onto concrete floor as far as one of the last times i wrestled you did you hip toss me on the concrete uh in pembroke yeah oh that's probably why my fucking hip's out of place. Thanks, pal. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for talking to us again. Maybe we'll check back in with you in the future, and if there's anything you want to say to the fans out there to, to shut this off, uh, we'll let you have the last word. All right, man. Uh, for all the promoters out there, put me on your show because uh, I do a hell of a job. And uh, support Great North Wrestling, Devin, uh, Devin Nicholson's promotion. It's a hell of a promotion. And uh, follow his YouTube channel because it's, uh, it's entertaining stuff. I'm on there all the time. Thank you for listening to the Great North Wrestling Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Hannibal TV on YouTube for all the latest GNW news and videos. Follow at Devin Hannibal on Twitter and check out our website at thehannibaltv.com.